Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, advancing beyond the beginning principles of the doctrines of Christ, you're not in preschool anymore. You don't go back to first grade when you finish sixth grade. We read we should go on to perfection. What did Solomon the wise say in Proverbs chapter 4? We shine more and more onto the perfect day. When is the perfect day? The resurrection for the first fruits. Jesus Christ is the only one that was perfect, but that was begotten and then born again. The only one that has penetrated through the door. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Now understand and look at that phrase, foundation of repentance. Didn't you do that? What does that tell you? If there's a foundation, there will be more repentance in the future, correct? If someone builds a building, they build the foundation first, the big slab of concrete. Then they got to go and make, that, see, that's the milk of the word, the foundation, the beginning principles. Then they go into the kitchen, they, they, they have the cabin tree, all the architectural work. This is the meat of the word. We don't go back to the foundation from dead works. What were you before you were called? You were a dead man walking in darkness. You don't go back to that. It says, and of faith in God. Before, whose faith did you believe in? Yourself. It says, of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands, that's when what? You receive the power of God. You're going back to that moment, the starting gate of the marathon? And of the resurrection of the dead? You didn't even know there was hope in one before. End of eternal judgment? What happens to the old man? Do they want to talk about eternal judgment? The fool never wants to see the results or the warnings. But the righteous do. And then we read here in 3, and we will do this. You know what the this is here? It's the perfection. If indeed God permits. So be careful on how you could... Go back to the beginning principles. Remember what John said, the apostle from the island of Patmos. That's in the Turkish area. He wrote to Ephesus, you have lost your first faith, your first love. Go back to it. And we'll talk more about that. We don't want to mess with that. Verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who personally obtained the heavenly gift and became partakers of the Holy Spirit and who have tasted the good word of God. Who is the word of God? Jesus, Jesus Christ. In fact, he said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. And we know those that eat of it shall live forever. And he could put some delay on that word. Forever, ever, ever. And that's what we want. It says, and the powers of the world to come. I have a CD produced called The World to Come. It's the gospel music of the world to come. And when God inspired me for that album, that's the verse that named the album. Why? Because we seek a world to come. It's a new earth. And that we have received the powers thereof. Now verse 6, if they have fallen away, the unpardonable sin. Because it says to renew them again unto repentance. You know how they renew their vows and they, they have a marriage. They say is under God and then they have to go and renew their vows. What did God mess up? We don't go back onto repentance of the foundation. 
We shine more and more onto the perfect day, don't we? That's the first fruits. It says here, seeing that they are crucifying the Son of God for themselves and are publicly holding him in contempt. You do not do this. Paul later talks about this in Hebrews 10, 26. For if we willfully go to sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, notice the word willfully, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. But I have terrifying expectation of inevitable judgment in a fierce fire which will devour the adversaries of God. Remember, God destroys the enemies of God, those that love what? The world. And now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8. But that which brings forth thorns, does this sound a little familiar about a story in Genesis? Remember Adam and Eve? Let's go there, Genesis 3, 17. And to Adam he said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife. We're supposed to listen to who? The voice of God. Remember, obey my voice. He says by the prophet. Adam listened to his wife. And have eaten of the tree of which I command you, saying, You shall not eat of it. The ground is cursed for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. And that is mankind, isn't it? It shall also bring forth thorns and thistles to you. And thus you shall eat the herbs of the field. So it hasn't been easy. What happens when you go into thorns and thistles? I've fell in them before. It hurts. So mankind has inherited this from who? Adam and Eve. So God gives us hope of a new creation. So we then can be enlightened and then fall on what? Good soil. Matthew 13, 22. And the one who was sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, so they hear it, but the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. Notice it doesn't say just riches. It's the love of money. It chokes the word. In other words, get out of here, Jesus. You choke Jesus Christ. You ever thought of that? When you do these actions, you're taking Jesus by the throat and saying, get out of here. Get out of my life. Think about what an insult that. It says, and it becomes unfruitful. And what did Jesus do to the fig tree? Cursed it. It's meant for the lake of fire, right? And that represents people. So we want to be on the next verse, the one who has sown on good ground. This is the one who hears the word and understands, who indeed brings forth fruit and produces one a hundredfold, another sixtyfold, and another thirtyfold. The lesson here is, in Hebrews 6, you don't want to have the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches choke you, which is actually choking the new creation, Jesus Christ, in you. And then you're left barren. You're left at your old man who can't have eternal life. The old man doesn't deserve re um, forgiveness. It's the new creation that deserves forgiveness. Is that correct? So many people, they argue what grace is and you, do you deserve it or not. It's the old man that doesn't deserve it. The new creation deserves God's forgiveness. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. But although we speak these things, beloved, we are persuaded of better things concerning you even the fruits that accompany salvation. So along this journey, we have the fruits of God. Where is that found? Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness. Nine is self-control. And these will accompany you the ways of God. Not your meekness, not your joy, not your kindness, that you had it with your old man. 
Remember the tree of the knowledge of good, that has kindness, and evil. See, that mixture is not of God. That leads to death. So we partake of the tree of life. So Adam had choice, didn't he? Do you know you had choice? Because you were called now to be a first fruit. So you partake. You didn't make Adam's move, did you? You took of the tree of life, didn't you? Come on, didn't you? When you were choked to baptize, had hands laid on you, how excited were you in the word? Right? Exuberant. How excited are you now? You should be more excited. I speak the truth. The truth shall set you free. We are not slaves to wickedness anymore. So what Paul's saying in this chapter is, you chose the tree of life. Shine more and more to the perfect day. Don't draw backwards to the old man. Verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and the labor of love. Keep that phrase in mind. The labor of love by which you have showed honor to his name. So anytime you're encouraging a brother that's down in the dumps, starting to do what Paul says don't do, going backwards, and you encourage them with the kingdom? Come on, brother. The finish line. Think of the glory in serving God and his kingdom. You're drawing back. See, you're now doing the labor of love, aren't you? You're helping God in his mastery. He's the potter, you're the clay. So you can also help how? By working and giving tithes. That does it, doesn't it? You're investing. Now I have a quick note on this. It's a fact. And they show this in the movie Hollywood world. They have, they have time travel movies. And they go back and they show Microsoft stock at a very, very low price. Just starting out. Nothing. No one knows about it. But they know. They have Amazon stock. But what they do is they invest in it. They go back to our present time and what happens in the movie. They're billionaires, okay? And they're, why did you know? How did you know? They invested everything. Remember the pearl of great price? The parable of the king. You would invest everything in that pearl of great price, right? That's exactly what God wants you to do with tithing. You have an opportunity to invest in the greatest work of all. How about that stock? Would you pass on it? How did you pass on it? You knew about it, the great multitude would say. You knew about this greatest stock? That blows away Amazon. Amazon will end. Not God's way. So it's a labor of love. It's a great harvest. It is a great work. Verse 11, but we earnestly desire that every one of you be demonstrating the same diligence. Notice every one of you. That's important. That's why is it tough for a teacher? A teacher, and you read all the teachers in the Bible, and they have flocks. It's very difficult because they want all the sheep. What did Jesus say? If one sheep goes astray, you're going to go after that sheep, right? That's a good teacher. And that sheep might not want to hear it, might not want to hear the truth and come back and all they might fight you. And you have them look up. You encourage them. And that's what we do. And it says, until the full assurance of the hope, until what? Until we uh, the last 10 years of our lives? Until the end. What is the end? The resurrection. How many times in the Bible can you highlight a word like the end and put the last trumpet, the resurrection? This is one of them right here. It is those that endure unto the end that are saved. No other, no other is going to make it unless you do that because that's scripture. Verse 12, so that you do not become lazy. That's a theme in the Proverbs. We have to be hard workers for the harvest, correct? So it's being lazy in what? The harvest. Anyone that draws back is not going to invest in the harvest, correct? They're investing in what they're going towards. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And as you draw backward, you become hard in heart, stiff neck. 
as you draw backward. That's why we must be softened heart and allow Christ in our heart and march forward. And as we march forward, we'll be more excited to invest in what? The labor of love. But that you be imitators. Now highlight the word imitators. Of those who through faith and steadfast endurance inherited the promises. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 11.1? 1, be imitators of me? Some would say blasphemy to that. How about you? Would you say that to him if he said that? You know it's the word of God. Be imitators of me? What if I said that and this wasn't written? But look at the next line. Exactly as I also am of Christ. In other words, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't listen to me up here if you see me telling false doctrines. Just shut off and listen to someone else that follows God. Let's go back to Hebrews 6, verse 13. For God, after promising Abraham, swore by himself since he could swear by none greater, saying, Surely in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply you. And that he did in a physical term, correct? But how about the spiritual? What do we think about when we're going to be blessed? When we ask God on our knees, please, God, be with me, bless me. Is your, are you thinking just of this realm? You know, the realm that's going to be all burned up. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Are you thinking just for this realm? How about when you're sitting on a throne forever? You're going to do greater things than Jesus. He said that. You'll do greater things than I did. It goes onward to eternity. Have your mind and focus on God's masterpiece in you. Now, that is motivational, isn't it? And so let's go to back to Hebrews. We go to Hebrews 6, verse 15. Now, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. That's Abraham. For indeed, men swear by the greater in confirmation by an oath, puts an end to all the disputes between them. In this way, God, desiring more abundantly to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable nature of his own purpose, confirmed it by an oath, so that by two immutable things, and that which it was impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to lay hold on the hope what is our hope? The kingdom that has been set before us. Now, verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. You're on a boat. Now that anchor, it goes down and it, it secures of the soul. It's, it's the foundation of the beginning principles. See, when someone wants to drift away, they'll pull up that anchor out of their soul and they'll do their own will. And they'll start to drift away from the promised land, correct? And that reminds me of Hebrews 2.1. For this reason, it is imperative that we give much greater attention to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should slip away. Actually, the word is drift away. So, would it be safe to say this chapter is about don't drift away? Those sailboats have broken free. You can see that they're actually, they're tied together when they're drifting. Oh no. I hope there's nobody in those sailboats. They must have broke free from their uh, anchor, but they have broken free. Those two boats are floating away together. Paul's saying, he's saying, don't drift away, focus on the kingdom. So that's what he's saying here, and he keeps reminding us of this theme. Don't drift away, both secure and be steadfast, in which enters into the sanctuary within the veil. So that's where we're headed, right? God's sanctuary. Verse 20, where Jesus has entered for us as a forerunner. You know what a forerunner means? A trailblazer. What is a trailblazer? If you were doing a maze 
and you saw it already accomplished, just imagine that you're doing this hard maze and you see it already accomplished and it, to the out, you would go, this is easy. And you'd follow it out and be free. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. He trailblazed the way. So who's going to look at Christ and accomplish the end game? The end game is follow Christ, you'll be saved, right? The ones that don't make it are the ones that follow their own path. And they hit dead ends in that maze, don't they? And then as they hit dead ends, and they curse others, and they're mad and angry at other people, they blame people, and they're going in circles. But all you have to do is look up and look at the trailblazer. Hebrews 12, 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great throng of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entraps us, where? In the maze. And let us run the race set before us with endurance, having your minds fixed on Jesus, the beginner and finisher of our faith. At the end of the maze, he's the door. So notice what Paul does in Hebrews 6. He ends with this. Look at the trailblazer and the ending. Meanwhile, there's these warnings in there. And then meanwhile, it ends with, look at Jesus. He's the solution. We need to look upward, brethren, having become a high priest, that's Jesus forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, chapter 7, next week, will be about Melchizedek. Who is Melchizedek? There's many controversies about this, but we'll let the Bible answer that question. So meanwhile, brethren, focus on the things in front of you that Jesus trailblazed and follow the path of righteousness, allowing the fruits of God to inspire and endure to the end of that finish line.